The first call came into the Everett Police Department at approximately 1825, 80, well, that would be 625 this evening. Okay, someone there. Everett Police. Right. Okay. Someone there. Oh, well, a friend of uh, Pete Peters, uh, uh, God, what do you, why can't I remember his name? Jerry, uh, called uh, the Seattle Flight Center. Okay, when he called the Seattle Flight Center, they had already seen, or they were seeing the object at the time. Seattle Flight Center at the same time was in touch with high brass in Washington, D.C. They called Seattle Flight Center and they were in touch. They, did they have the object under observation? They did. They did at the time. I, I don't know if they had it exactly at that time, but when the object was reported, a call was made to Seattle Flight Center. They claimed, Seattle Flight Center said that they were, they saw it, or they were in the process of seeing it, okay. and they were in touch with Washington, D.C. Okay. The object was seen as far as Alberta, Canada, was seen as far east as Spokane, and other cities across the state. Okay, so that, I don't think I'm going to put that out. It was seen as far north? Well, it, as far north as, north as Alberta, Canada. Seen as, as far east as Spokane. Okay. Okay, now, Jerry called Payne Field and he was notified that Payne Field had the object under observation for three minutes.
Okay. He's uh he's gonna trip further. He wanted to know if I could check this out and I told him indeed try to check him up. And I told him something and I and I believe this. It seems that these fireball type sightings yeah. always are followed by a flap. Yeah. And I told him to watch it. You know, I think that that may uh it may be indicative of a flap. I told him there's more to it than that because this thing was seen for, like you say, for five minutes. Yeah, well, see, there's a problem, see. The estimate is very, to, to, for an object to be seen for three or five minutes, and the witnesses said it was traveling very slow. Yeah. Uh, it would have either had to be really high and extremely huge, or very low, or medium, you know, yeah. three to five thousand feet, right. and going slow. And it ain't no goddamn bolide. Uh, okay. So that's it. Uh, he's gonna call me tomorrow night. There may be some witnesses down here who, at the uh, Seattle Flight Center, who may want to talk. And I'm gonna go down and uh, do some investigations on that. Uh, and he's gonna do some more checking tonight. He'll either call me tomorrow, but when he comes here on s Sunday, he may have most of the report all typed up. He's calling Heineck off on that. Okay. And that's it. Very good. Okay, we'll see you later. Right. Bye. Just uh, right during the news, and uh, I was looking, uh, the couch faces the, the window, and I just glanced out the window because I noticed this bright, glowing object. Like, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't an airplane. I knew that because they have those uh, mercury lights in them yes. that are really bright lights. And uh, I've uh, been out with my cousin, and he's a, uh, he's a uh, lieutenant commander in the uh, Navy. You know, continuous flight, plan, flight uh, plans and training, training yeah. films and things. And uh, I knew it was an airplane. And I looked at it, and I saw what appeared to be sparks sitting out of the back of it. So immediately, what I thought it was was a uh, a plane in distress uh, on low power, which would cause the lights to dim, and uh, it was on fire. And I looked at it, and I started walking towards the window. I got up. And uh, I went to go out on the lanai, and it was gone. Just, it was, it, uh, I saw it glow. It looked like it was heading south for a couple, it looked like it hit, was heading south for about two seconds, and then it turned east immediately, and it accelerated. It accelerated, and a lot of sparks were coming out of the back immediately when it hit, started heading east. That's why it's not an accelerator, you saw that part. Yeah. Okay. And that was for about three and a half seconds. Mm -hmm. And then that was it. And that was it. Then I just, I opened the lanai door and it was gone. Mm -hmm. Everything, the sky was clear and then I saw about five minutes later, uh, either a helicopter or an airplane begin to circle the area in which I saw it. Mm -hmm. The plane did move into the area. Yes, I think either a plane or a, a some type of helicopter. Uh -huh. It was kind of like uh, north of Ballard. I see. It seemed like that's about the location where the plane was. Okay, right. When we heard about a helicopter being out there, we didn't know exactly where it was at. Okay, can we get one of our uh, investigators to call you up later for a little more extensive uh, information on this? That would be perfectly okay. The best time, in fact, the best time to call me we're probably around 8 or 9 in the evening because I'm always home and I'm always awake. Very good. Okay. Thanks very much. Okay. Any, did you want to say something else? Uh, no, it's... Oh, well, I was going to mention if you needed any recipes or anything, right? Well, that would be great. Okay. Thanks a lot Other for time. calling. Yes. Bye. Bye-bye. Hi, Bob. Yes, sir. Yeah, sorry to bother you. Not at all. Uh, I just had a call that I thought you might want to log in. Uh, up in Vancouver, uh, off Vancouver. I just had a call from a guy in Vancouver Island, on Vancouver Island. Okay. And they saw the same thing. Beautiful. They saw the same thing off, uh, just off Vancouver Island. It, 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 they thought it looked like a plane on fire. It was just very fiery and quite streaky. Uh-huh. And so we called in a reporter, so I figured since I'd save the call and, uh, you know, send the money and call you instead. Beautiful. Uh, what's the man's name? The Okay, beautiful. I've been, uh, I call this the uh, Associated Press. They haven't had a thing on it. Mm -hmm. Let's 
I had a thing on it, but I did get a call from a senior at Queen Anne High School who lives on uh, right overlooking the water on Queen Anne Hill, and uh, he saw the thing over the sound, oh, yeah. and it was maneuvering at the time, and then by the time he got through the window, the thing had uh, turned east and just shot away like a bullet. I'll be down. Well, uh, it looks like there's more than one then. I think so. It appears that way. Well, I'll be down. And usually this sort of thing over the past, uh, we've experienced that uh, other areas that have had similar widespread sightings, which appear to be fireball type activity, are usually followed up with extensive activity in the future. I'll be down. Okay, well, listen, I'll talk to you later then. Thanks a lot, Chad. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. For the uh, for the uh, for the uh, field team, yeah. And I received a call at home while I was at work, and I thought I'd call back. And I called his home phone. There was no answer, so I called the uh, called the line on the car because I guess he's got a hot sighting going someplace, and I thought he might need me. Yeah. Are you one of the parties that uh, has a CB radio? Yes. Okay. Well, we had an object go over the Pacific Northwest tonight about 6:25. Uh -huh. We've been getting reports from as far north as Alberta, uh, I mean Edmonton, Alberta, and east to Spokane and south to the Dalles, Oregon. Uh -huh. And apparently there's more than one object involved here. Uh -huh. And uh, <clears throat> I was just on the other line talking to a newsman, and he says that uh, citizens band people are picking up quite a bit of information. And yeah. Apparently something going on over around the coma right now. Yeah, well, uh, we've got a CB set up here at home, and uh, we've been uh, monitoring off and on, but uh, we keep, we've got 23 channels to scan, and uh, we can't really uh, we can't really pick out which one the action's on right now. Right. Okay, I'll get back to you if I get anything uh, important. Yeah. Give me a call, too. Oh, incidentally, uh, I brought up Jake the other day. Uh, uh, an idea of contacting some of the local radio stations like KJR who did the big deal on uh, on the, the car statement yes. and uh, possibly KOL, although they're not really that into it. But when I, uh, I, I heard, I believe yesterday in the morning, an interview with you on KOL, and when I called KJR this morning for an appointment with Chet Rogers, they said you've been in contact with them. Yes, I have. Oh, I see. Well, would there be any point in me going ahead and, uh, and making contact with them then? Jake gave me a bunch of promo material to pass out. Uh -huh. So I was just wondering if I should go ahead and make contact with them myself. Well, they're pretty well up on it down there. I see. Yeah. I think you'll probably save yourself a little time. Yeah. Well, time I got plenty of. Oh. <laughs> Anyway, uh, that's basically it. Uh, I didn't get a chance to talk to Jake. I, I've been trying to get set up uh, on a schedule so we can all get together and meet. You know, with yes, me. I know he's talking about that. Yeah, and uh, I just got screwed up on my hours at work, so I'm not sure just when we'll be, all be able to get together and go at once. It looks like right now that after 8 o'clock on a weekday night will be just about the only time we'll be able to get together. Because I'm working kind of a split swing shift. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll get in touch. With, or I mean, in touch. With, I'm a little bit confused okay. here tonight, but I've been going from phone to phone. And yeah. Well, if you do get a sighting, say in the South Seattle area, uh, none of us have too much gas right now. But if you do get a good valid sighting in the South Seattle area, give us a ring because we got. Uh, well, if nothing else, we can siphon gas from two cars to put into a third okay. and get someplace. Fine. Okay. Thanks a lot. Bye. Good morning. This is Bob Gribble of Phenomena Research in Seattle, Washington. Mm hmm What kind of information or recent information do you have on the so called meteor impact area near McKinnon? Uh I, it was in Lewis County, uh down by Chicalis. Oh, Lewis County. Yeah, you want me to give you the phone number? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, Do you have the approximate location of that? Uh, well, evidently it was somewhere near the county line, and all I had was oh, a... Okay.
We did have a complaint at, um, oh, about let's see, 8 o'clock last night, and said in the tonal area, which is in our county, but it turned out to be south of that. So I don't really know. Evidently, it was, you know where the steam plant is down there in Lewis County? Yes. Evidently, it was 10 to 15 miles west of that. But that's uh, just, you know, hearsay information. I really don't have anything definite. Okay, thanks very much. Mm -hmm. Bye bye. Bye bye. CD Radio, Don speaking. News Department, please. This is the News Department. Okay, this is Bob Gribble of Phenomena Research in Seattle, Washington. All right. We would like to get a little information on that so-called fireball scene in your area last night. Okay, I'll tell you what I know, but it ain't much. Okay. Uh, you want to ask me questions? Well, uh, Phenomena Research. Right. That sounds cool. <laughs> <laughs> is it something like, believe it or not, or? Oh, no, we, uh specifically investigate UFO reports. Yeah, that's cool. That's, that's, that's really interesting. Okay. Like well, I say, do you want to ask a question? you want me to tell you what I know? Which is well, fun. tell me what you know first. Okay. Um, the Lewis County Sheriff's Department is probably the, uh, the most local person that talks to me about it and is willing to say that they know anything. And they tell me that uh, Last night, McCord Air Force Base Air Approach called them and said that one of their planes had seen an impact um, in Lewis County and that they saw a fire on the ground at that spot. Uh, they reported that they had seen it um, something like 7.35 p.m. and that it was on a line between McKenna and Cinnabar. Somewhere uh, between those two, they said that it was looked like it was about three miles north of Cinnabar and 13 miles south of McKenna. Okay. The Sheriff's Department says that makes it within a circle radius of something like 30, uh, 30 mile radius circle. Um, they, uh, I guess McCord sent a chopper to look around, uh, but I guess clouds. Uh, took over so that he had to give up the search. Mm -hmm. And uh, according to the sheriff, again, nothing, no search has been going on since that time, but the sheriff's department says they're going to send their chopper, the sheriff's chopper out at 10 o'clock to look around that spot, see if they can find any fire or anything. Mm -hmm. um, okay. You know, have you had any calls? Okay. Personally, the only calls that I've had is from other radio stations asking, you know, what do you know? I, I haven't had a single person call and say, we saw something. Um, and the sheriff's department just told me that they hadn't had a single person call, you know, a civilian and say, we saw this thing, you know, what's going on? Yes. Uh, a plane crash or anything like that. Okay. Uh, as far as that goes, I heard a tape on another radio station. They played a, a man they said was an FAA official saying that uh, people said that they'd seen it all the way up into Canada and that, you know, all around the state of Washington people had seen a, a fireball. Yes. Um, but like I say, I've got no calls here. Neither is the other radio station. They just told me the other radio station they talking about. They say they heard from no one other than other radio station. Okay, we are in search of witnesses to this thing in your area. Is there any chance of getting any kind of a blurb on your news? That you are? Ah, yeah, I'd say so. I'm, I'm probably going to be in search of myself because, like, uh, That'd be the only thing that, that I'd have, you know, to tell people that somebody said they saw it. Okay. Um, right. You haven't discovered any yet, have you? Oh, yes. You have? We were flooded with calls last night. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, they, everywhere from uh, 6.15 to about 7.45 reported today. I guess the reason, or I would assume the reason, maybe you can, you know, verify this, would be why it, you know, that, that not too many people called around here is it because where it fell is just an extremely, you know, nobody lives there. You know, miles of uh, logging roads is all in there. Yes. Out in the field. So. Well, we had, uh, <clears throat> like I say, many individual sightings here, and many of them at uh, low-level altitudes around the Seattle area. Yeah. Have you uh, heard from anybody from Lewis County? No, I called there, and I couldn't get any information at all. By Lewis County, I mean, have you heard any citizens from Lewis no. County calling? No. Okay, Mr. Gribble, well, I yeah, hope you find something. Hope I do, too. Uh, uh, you might call back, like I say, I'll, you know, I will probably be, if, if they don't find anything, I'll probably be going down 
to the area myself, see if I can find anybody who says he's Okay, well, thanks a lot. Okay, you are. Right. Thing about it until 
we came home and thought this, you know, this lady was crossing in and they were talking about it all over the place. So we thought we could have called somebody up and see if we had anything that we could use. Okay, now this is by the Sun Top Lookout Station? Yeah, it's right down by Mount Rainier, it's on uh, 410 going up in the path. It's on okay. the Huckleberry Creek, you take the Huckleberry Creek after. Okay. Uh, now, approximate time, do you have any idea of what? Well, let's see, we're up at 5,000 feet, it, it just got dark out. I mean, uh, you know, before you could see the sun still kind of, and uh, it just got dark out. I would go with probably about 8.30, whatever time of the night it was at the end of the day. Yeah, 8.30. Yeah. yeah. About 9 o'clock. The night. reason I ask this is because there are several objects involved. Yeah, we, we saw two of them. We just got a glimpse of the second one. But the one we saw, he's it, it paralleling. They're coming kind of northeast from the mountain. We saw it first, it was at the northeast, and it, it you know, kind of paralleled the mountain. And it looked like right over to the path in the Yakima area someplace, it just kind of crumpled up and went down. Now, you say this was coming from the northeast? Um, yes, yeah, from the northeast a little bit. It was uh -huh. more from east. And kind of running parallel with the mountain range? Yeah. Uh-huh. And uh, it was really strange because we just saw it. And we, we, we right away we were looking at it through binoculars. And I don't even know how far away from it we were, but from what we saw, it, you know, it was flaming, whatever it was, and it had a, you know, a, a tail on it. Uh -huh. And I thought it was just a king-sized skyrocket, but then it uh, couldn't be that. So if that's what it looked like. The tail was about, from where we were, it was about 100 yards long. It was pretty gigantic, and then it, was, it looked like a plane facing it. It probably looked like You say it looked like there was a plane chasing it? Yeah. It looked, you know, it was behind it about, uh, you know, 15 minutes or so, but, it, but uh, whatever it was we saw it was really good. He was really moving right along. Yeah, and that was just the one or two? That was the one. One, okay. And then we saw it, if it got about parallel with it, which is about, well, I'd say down a little more, about 10 miles more uh, south towards Mount Rainier, we saw it break up. Uh -huh. And it went down and it wasn't a flame anymore, so I think it was whatever it was, it was all out of flame. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean. Right. You know, it broke up into about, you know, we don't know how many feet it was. It was really strange looking. Then we got a glimpse of another one. I think it was the one that everybody's talking about. It's going probably not in the middle of But this first one was followed by aircraft. Uh, it might have been. And we saw, you know, airplane lights were definitely following it. Yeah. And, uh, Within, within, you know, a certain specific area, they were following, you know, you know following me in, I don't know, 15 minutes or so. They were tracking pretty close, and as soon as, as we saw it, there was, you know, like, you know, it's all kinds of airplanes all over the place. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so, you know, that's all we saw it pretty much. And then this was followed by another object that you saw? Uh, well, the, the one that, the other object that we saw was coming in a completely different direction. Okay. And it was it was over by well see we're between kind of like Enum Claw and, and Mount Rainier up on Cinnamon Pass we're kind of northeast of Mount Rainier mm -hmm. and obviously northeast northeast of Mount and we saw one kind of pass between us and Mount Rainier we just saw a glimpse of it and we didn't see any more we just said, look there's another one that went down we didn't see it. and that was about uh, within ten minutes after the other one. About they would say about uh, 840 then. Yeah, I don't know if those were the right time, but yeah. we thought, you know, right together they were real close. Okay, and uh, now on that first one, approximately how long were you watching it? Oh, how long were you watching? Three minutes about, I guess. It, was, it lasted a long time. That long? Yeah. Okay, now how about that second one? No, I don't know, about 10 seconds. It's just, yeah, just a flash just a flash But that, I mean, the one that we saw was just, you know, it was just coming. It wasn't going down, it wasn't going up, it was just paralleling the top of the mountain. It was the same elevation all the time, just going right through the crowd. Mm -hmm. And then it, uh, I was watching through the binoculars glass, and, and we saw it, I just saw it, you know, it just kind of got real brighter a second, and then it just kind of broke up and went down. And that's all we saw. After that, I mean, we saw... You know, we passed, you know, that's all we saw. We didn't see anything like that. Right. No sound? No, we didn't, we didn't hear any sound. 
Could you hear that aircraft that was falling in? No, we couldn't. We be, that was being drowned out by an airplane that was going right over the top of us about that time, which I think was the Ranger who was checking us out. <laughs> oh. I should tell you the truth, but, but he was pretty, the Ranger, whoever it was, was going over the top of us, he was in a prop plane, and he was pretty loud. Yeah, they could get pretty noisy. So he was drowning out the rest of whatever he was and uh, whoever was up there in that plane definitely thought because if they couldn't miss it, you know, he, like it was like uh, somebody holding a mask up in the sky. Uh-huh. It was really impressive. Okay, is there any other information you can add to that? Talk well, to anyone else that saw it. Well, me and my friend were there, but he has the same thing. You know, we kind of yep. worked this out before we talked to him. Oh, we sure appreciate your calling. Yeah, you know, anything that's, uh, anything else that, you know, you have any questions with, you know, you'd be glad to ask it. Okay, well, if anything comes up, we'll just be on the phone calling you. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you for calling. Mm-hmm, bye. bye. This is Bob Gribble of Phenomena Research. Yeah. I'm calling to get a little bit of information about your study last Thursday night. Okay. Uh, could you give me the time on that? I believe I forgot to ask you. Okay, the time was about 6 o'clock, I think. I was watching the news. I didn't look at the clock. About yeah, about that. Okay. Uh, and I believe that you said that the color was orange. Yeah. Well, it was... It was... It wasn't really orange. It was, uh... You know, kind of like the fire you see in a fireplace. I see. It was that, it was kind of a dull, that kind of dull color. Now, uh, are you facing due west in your home, where you, uh, through the window that you were seeing? It's, a, it's an apartment. I'm facing uh, to the north, to the northwest. Northwest. Pretty much either way, because it's a wraparound window. I the window see. faces west, and then it faces north. None of my uh, friends at school, or uh, no one else I know, has seen it, or saw it, or anything, just from what I heard over the radio. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot, Gary. Okay, um, is there, have they ever found a site where it uh, has landed or anything? Or no. Or hit the earth? No, no, I don't think they will either. Yeah, they said that uh, the it was that by the time it hit the earth, it was about the size of the uh, baseball. Could be. <laughs> yeah, well, the thing that was weird about it is that it seemed to take a southerly direction, but then it it uh, accelerated towards the east. Uh-huh. I mean, towards the, yeah, towards the east. You're definite about that turn, then. Yeah. Uh-huh. It's, yeah, it did. It turned. Uh-huh. It turned, accelerated, and then it was gone. Well, you see how that in itself would eliminate the meteor theory. Because meteors just do not turn. They come yeah. in the atmosphere of anywhere from 40 to 140,000 miles an hour. And of course, depending upon their angle of descent, it yeah. depends on how fast they burn up, but they never change course. Yeah. It took a right angle turn yeah. due east. Yeah. It's just, it just like it like it uh, was, was a uh, jet fighter coming in for a, coming in for a, a straight. And then just just like that same sloping pattern where it was coming in, and then it just took a right angle turn and headed east, uh-huh. just like that. And then during this acceleration, or what appeared to be an the acceleration, there were uh, um, intermittent sparks, or what appeared to be sparks coming out of the tail, yeah. that were trailed about three times as long as the object. And you're pretty sure that that uh, you for, when you first saw it that it was uh, coming from due north. It was coming, yes, yeah, coming due north, heading south. south. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Bye now. And, uh, we're interested in getting some information regarding your sighting of the large fireball the night of the 14th. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. 
I wonder if you would give us a full description of what happened right from the beginning. Well, let's see. I turned on to the street going to my house, which runs north, and my wife uh, said, look, I looked up and I uh, saw, um, what, ye- not a yellow light, an orange uh, flame ball traveling in the northern sky. From where I was going, it was traveling, uh, looked like a southeast really direction from where I was at. But I'm not too good on my compass right now. Uh, oh, I watched it for a good three to four minutes from the time I got out of the car, probably a minute before, maybe a half minute before I stopped the car. So I watched it for about four and a half minutes. And then I watched what uh, it seemed to break off. We had one section of flame, then clear sky, and then the major portion of flame. Uh-huh. Uh, I watched it, and then it uh, faded from sight after about four minutes of seeing it. Uh, to the southeast? Yeah. Uh-huh. Was there a fairly heavy cloud layer at the time, or was this rather... No, it was uh, crystal clear. I could, you know, I could see all the stars and everything. We were in between clouds and everything, and it was clear all the way up. Uh, I, there was something mentioned on KJR radio about uh, you contacting would-be yeah. air station. I contacted over there air operations, you know, see if we'd lost an aircraft. Uh, and we had all our aircraft uh, accounted for. And uh, I was talking to the lieutenant commander there. I can't remember his name offhand. But uh, he was observing it uh, from the air operations tower. Yes. And uh, he called radar real quick, and they weren't able to pick anything up. Uh, I don't know whether it was just too far or or what, uh, but they were unable to pick anything up off of it. Now, when you called him, uh, had you concluded your sighting at the time? I mean, had it gone out of sight to yes, you? Yes, it, it, had, it had been out of sight to me uh-huh. for maybe, oh, four minutes from the time I finished driving home to the time I got to the phone. And then uh, uh, you went in and called this commander, and he said that he was watching it, or he had watched it? He had it. watched it. He had watched it. Okay. Yeah. And that was, it appeared to be heading southeast. Did it appear to go over the Cascades, or was there too much cloud cover to tell? Uh, well, I don't really, I, it was heading towards the Cascades. I guess from where it was at, it was in that area of being to the Cascades, uh, I haven't lived here too long. I'm not too familiar with the area around here. Uh-huh. Uh, but it might have been 60 miles at the maximum from where I was at, maybe closer. I see. Was this, uh, <clears throat> I know visual estimates are hard to tell, but was this fairly high in the sky to you? About what uh, degree would you say it was? Oh, I'd say I was looking at about... Uh, 10 o'clock, uh, maybe 10, 15 in the sky. Uh-huh. Uh, it wasn't uh, real high. It was spreading more along the 30, 40 degrees above the horizon. I see. Mm-hmm. Was it quite large? <coughs> mm. This is hard to tell, too. Yeah. Let's see. From previous meteorites, whatever I've seen, uh, it was extremely large. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was, I'd estimate, maybe a mile and a half, two miles long, uh, the flame trail was. Yes. Uh, the actual head of it, I couldn't tell, but the flame was maybe a mile and a half, two miles long. Mm-hmm. And no, no change of direction at all while you had it under observation? Uh, no, I just kept noticing that it kept flying horizontally. You know, instead of diagonally like most meteorites, it was going horizontally. Uh-huh. That's what made me think of maybe an aircraft, because I've seen them fly horizontally a long time while I'm playing. Yes. So. And uh, the exact time was about 6.20, you say? 6.20, uh, yeah, thereabouts, because I remember uh, I just returned from the store, and I left the store at 6.15. Uh-huh. Have you talked to anyone else who has seen it in your area? Uh, I've tried to find a few other people. Uh, 
we have a lieutenant commander in my squadron who's, uh, who was in the air at that time and uh, observed it for a while. I see. And Are you in the Navy now? Yes, I am. Uh -huh. Well, I was just wondering, had you reported it officially, or have you kind of kept it to yourself? Well, I called my squadron, and, uh, you know, then their operation. And our squadron had, uh, they called uh, some outfit in North Dakota, I can't remember what it was, something to do with, uh, you know, the observation of these things. And yeah. My skipper called that. Probably NORAD. But, uh, other than calling the, uh, news station, uh, I wasn't able to catch the number for the research center down there yes. to call them. Mm -hmm. Well, I sure appreciate your talking to me. If we sent you a questionnaire, would you take the time to fill it out? Sure, certainly. It's, uh, it's quite brief, but we'd like to get this on record. We have other reports of things for the same evening, and we're trying to correlate the flight directions and the time so we can see what we've got, whether it's one or more One objects. or more objects. Right. Yeah. Just in case you should... Uh, see something else in the future or hear of anything being oh, seen? Oh, yeah. I, I've seen things before in other locations in Southern California in the desert. But uh, this is the first one I've seen up here. Uh-huh. And there, is there anything else you're going to add to this? Mm, no, not that I can think of. Uh, I thought they had an approximate location where she went down. Well, uh, this, is not, this is a different case. Oh. This took place at 7.50 the same night. Oh, the one that went down? Right. They observed at 7.50? Right. right. And I observed one at 7... 6.20. Six, at 6.20. Right. And one was also observed in eastern Washington, approximately 6.25. So we got ourselves a little jigsaw puzzle here. <laughs> yeah. Huh. I think I'll get some of my books out. They aren't expecting any meteorite swarms that I know of. Well, this area. there was a meteor shower due, but then uh, the flight characteristics there would rule out a meteor anyway. Yeah, that's, that's what bugged me. Uh, do meteorites don't travel horizontally, do they? No way. <laughs> that's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you okay. very much for talking to me. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. I was on a, in a pilot aircraft with two other guys come back from Walla Walla. And we were on instruments, uh, so we were at about 12,000 feet. And shortly after we, uh, being on instruments, we were in constant contact with uh, radio and uh, vertically clear up there. And just we passed in here on our left, uh, and we're just going to begin our descent into the into the clouds. By on the on the right, we were on a trajectory. If you drew a line from the Yakima, we were over the Yakima uh, Airport and. Put that vector right on in, so you draw a line from Jack to Seattle. We were proceeding not quite northwest, kind of a west northwest direction. Yeah. Uh, just we went, well, we'll be on Rainier, and just we, can, we, we know the location. Uh, another guy, Craig Sly, Sly, knows it better than I do. He was in navigation, but he, he was beyond a 625 checkpoint, and it was before 635 when we checked again. Uh, we went back over the flight plan. Uh, off to the right and to the kind of front of the airplane, which we could low, you know, trying to go back and looking at the trajectory, say somewhere over Vancouver Island or up in the island someplace, maybe toward Marysville. Yeah. It was a rather bright object, uh, you know, like a moon color, uh, white or yellow, yellowish white. Uh, ball. At first, they thought it was a afterburner, a bright afterburner. But uh, you know, it, it started increasing size. Where it got about, oh, not quite 90 degrees off to our right. You know, somewhere up toward Baker, it uh, appeared as a white ball with a tight V-shaped cone of uh, multicolored red, blue, yellow sparks, or it kind of looked to me like a comet. Yes. Uh, a ball and in a space of uh, a little bit and then uh, all these uh, fantastic uh, colors following it. We followed it, they followed it a little bit longer. They asked me if they may have had it in view a minute, minute, five, ten seconds. I figured I had it in view about 45 seconds when they 
called because they thought a while and they said, my, it's right after burner and I didn't see my face. God, look at that. And then we, uh, we followed it and, and it was right off the right wing tip. In fact, we had to bank a little bit to keep it in view. And then uh, as it went hmm, kind of off toward the Cascades, it, uh, it burned out and it started to break up. You could see the yellow kind of you know, flash off in all directions and uh, then it faded and was gone. Yes. Um, that's uh, the first thing I've ever seen of that uh, that size or that intensity in the sky, but I I immediately uh, thought it was a meteor or something burning out. You know, it wasn't like a falling star. It was going horizontal. It wasn't losing any altitude. Yeah. And uh, the other pilot who has, you know, 2,000 or more hours flying, just got back in trip to Tokyo, said that he'd estimate with it slightly above horizon level and that far off could have been 60 to 90,000 feet. Maybe, you know, yeah. 70,000 feet would be his best estimate. Yeah, and that if that thing burned out and dropped, you know, and stay with the probably been over the Cascades, it was kind of headed on a trajectory we figure parallel to it. Might have landed someplace like Green Coulee if it landed at all. Mm -hmm. But that's the trajectory kind of from, uh, oh, say, Bellingham to uh, the Coulee Dam would be parallel to our Yakima at uh, uh, Seattle, and it looked like it was paralleling. It could have been going more west to east. In other words, staying up, you know, parallel to the border. Yeah. It's very possible to expect. But it wasn't coming anywhere like toward us because we had no, you know, fear like anything was going to happen or was going to get near the city. Right. And uh, what was the approximate time, would you say? Between 6.25 and 6.30. I mean, 6.35. It would be about 6.30. It would be, and that's accurate because it's between two checkpoints. I see. Okay, well, this is very interesting because we got another report from a woman in Soap Lake, in the Soap Lake area, it said the key saw something about 6.25, which was traveling approximately west to east or northwest to southeast, and it burst in the area over there. It looked like they made these large uh, aerial bombs going off. That would be about where I would say it could have terminated. Uh, I tell you, you could check with Seattle Ground uh, Control. There were three other pilots confirmed it on the air. We didn't. Mm -hmm. There was a Northwest Airlines flight pilot. Northwest Airlines, if you got a bright object on your radar, he asked. And United Airlines said, I see it too. United Airlines, and I also have it view. And then a fellow who was using a twin Comanche. He was commenting on it, and carried on, they carried on a little dialogue with John Control. And John Control said they didn't have it on, uh, no, nothing showing on radar. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I could uh, just distance away, show it distance away. But uh, there would be, there'd be three other pilots that, uh, that verified it, and uh, it would be someone, and they would have to have been on instruments, so they would have had to file a flight plan, and I know one was Northwest, one was United, and one had a twin engine Comanche. Yes. I don't know the destination. Ours was Boeing Field, I assume the other two were SeaTac, going to coming. But, uh, would you say that that would be in sight long enough for radar to pick it up? I don't know that much about radar. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was really moving. I mean, we knew it was a long ways away, you know, 100 miles or so, or, you know, 50 to 100 miles. It was out there. It was nowhere near us, and it went from the front of the plane right on back, kind of toward behind the plane. Yeah. Which uh, would have to be, uh, well, knowing uh, you'd have to be uh, 150, 200 miles. Just a second. Somebody doesn't know I'm on the line. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Uh, I wonder if uh, the other two gentlemen who were with you would object to my contacting them. Oh, I doubt it. Well, I've got them. Just a second. I've got somebody on the other line. Okay. Okay. Yes, uh, just a couple more questions. In your opinion, would you consider this uh, a meteor, considering the time that it was in play? Yeah, it was too large to be anything else. I mean, it was... Uh, Although I've never seen a good-sized satellite 
I guess I don't know how large they are, but this is a this was a one good sized mass. Uh, they, you know, I've heard of satellites coming in and burning them. On MC, uh, I don't know how large those satellites are. Is what I'm yeah. saying. It would be something. Uh, you know, I would say it's a meteor, yeah, because uh, yeah, I thought it was a tiny old comet. Yeah. When I first saw it, that would have been my, uh, you know, but comets are in sight, as I understand it, now from doing more research than I thought. They're in sight much longer. Yeah, so they they don't move like meteors anymore. Anyway. No, yeah. this, right. this thing was moving. So yeah. then, you know, based on what I found out since, I was right. in fact. Uh, we saw it burn out this year, right? Now, I know there's a newsman here in town who'd like to talk to you. Uh, would you be interested in talking to him? Sure. And then you wouldn't object if I passed your number on. No, not the least. Thank you very much, Doctor. Bye. 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 I wonder if I could get a rundown on that little experience you had the night of the 14th. Yeah, okay. Did you get a hold of me? No, I uh, couldn't get through the office. The phone was busy, and then I tried to get his uh, number from information. Oh, That's yeah. Nice. Okay. Well, we were flying along at about oh, 900 feet between uh, Bainbridge Island and Seattle. Yes. All right, I was about the northern, midpoint northern tip of uh, Alcott. Uh -huh. And all of a sudden, we've seen this bright thing from across the sky. And it looked like, you know, on a flight path, you might see what it would look like it had come out of showcase and heading for, you know, Seattle. Yeah. And so it had a long, flaming tail on it. it. You know, you know, like a jet or something, you know? Yeah. Okay. And it proceeded along this, and uh, heading towards Seattle. And we noticed at first, and it's probably right mid point to the channel, in between the two. Uh -huh. And uh, we both watched it real careful. And I called Sita or uh, King County Tower on the radio and notified them that I had seen it. So I didn't know what it was. Uh, it seemed to have a, a a body to it, you know, you know what I mean, you know what I'm talking about, I don't know. A glow? Yeah, a main glow in front, and then, you know, with the tail behind it. Yeah. All right. It stayed on its normal tra uh, trajectory, heading towards the ballard area. And it, then all of a sudden, as it got over towards the ballard area, it really glowed. You know, it just really came on strong. And the tail seemed to die off, and then it disappeared. I see. Now, did you get a pinpoint of time on that? Well, it's between 6 and 6.30, I can tell you that, definitely. So, King County Tower would have my uh, conversation on radio. Uh-huh. Because we're supposed to record all uh, conversations. And when I talked to them, I told them, and uh, they said, well, they get in touch with the proper authority. And, yeah. You know, so... If you probably contact the UFO rules, uh, they would have that on hand, exactly what kind of thing to yeah. How about an altitude? Is that awesome? Do you have any idea? It was probably... Oh... I was looking through the cockpit there. So it was probably sitting oh, a little from a thousand... Oh, right around a thousand feet. A little higher, maybe 1,200 to 1,000 feet. And that would, uh, in other words, you wouldn't have to look up no, very much to see it. No, I did not look up. No, all I did was look right up the side of my helicopter and, uh, you know, you see it. And it never did appear like it had, uh, you know, closed or anything like this. It just all of a sudden, you know, really glowed real bright and that was it. Uh -huh. Well, now, we had another call, I'd like to be interested in this. We had another call from a party living on Queen Anne Hill, mm -hmm. overlooking the water. Yeah. And uh, he was said he was watching the news between 6 and 6.30. He couldn't pinpoint the exact time, but he yeah. said he spotted this thing coming down the sound, almost due south, north to south. 
meaning, and uh, he could have got almost a breath to Seattle as he went to Seattle, as he saw it, and the thing seemed to make a 90-degree turn and just get it east. Yeah, well, that could have been very well, yeah. but uh, like I go that would put it on a fairly close if it was heading towards uh, out of the of the Kingston area, yeah. heading towards the Ballard area, it would be on kind of a fairly close. But when we seen it, it was more or less heading over towards our eastbound heading to the, you know, you might say it was flying back. Yeah. yeah. What would you say the duration of the sighting was? From the time you first saw it, so it just blinked out. Uh, probably... A good solid minute. Mm-hmm. Minute, maybe more. Mm-hmm. You didn't hear any other air traffic on that? No, I even asked uh, the tower in my conversation if anybody else had sighted it, because there were other aircraft in the air at the time. And, uh, in fact, it was kind of hard to see a lot of this thing and you know, keep an eye out for other aircraft, because I was more of a more attention to the thing that was going through the world, whatever yeah. it was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Have no. you found any debris or anything out in that area? No, no. The, uh, you see, there's a conflict here. We either we, we we know we've got two different objects for that night, and possibly yours could be a third. Oh. And uh, uh, we're trying to pin it down exactly and get the times as exact as we can to get this jigsaw puzzle put together. But we know there are two different projects. One was seen about uh, running about 6.20 to about 6.25 and the sightings range almost in a straight line from uh, northwest up to Vancouver Island and on into BC southwest or southeast over to the Grand Coulee area. Then we have your sighting, which is much lower altitude. Yeah. And then there was a third one, which uh, involved the so-called impact area down around uh, Central and Sahara. Yeah. <coughs> well, do these meteorites, when they come in like that, do they bust off at times? I don't know about that. Well, occasionally a large bolide, which is really a large piece of junk, will explode. Uh, but uh, usually when they do, why they're heard for miles. Mm. The flash is just fantastic. So I doubt that if that's what we're dealing with. And of course, uh, they usually only last two or three seconds, maybe five seconds up to the point. Oh, I see. Oh, we'll talk to you. I guess. Yeah. 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 I tell you quite a bit in my helicopter. And, uh, we, my, my co-pilot, he, he was watching, uh, watching the whole thing too. Uh-huh. But, uh, like I say, you could really pinpoint the exact time. If you contact King County Tower, or actually contact the uh, FAA down on Bowling Field, or King County Field now. And, uh, we're supposed to change the ball up again. Yeah. <coughs> Which, uh, this object was traveling in a horizontal trajectory? Yeah, kind of a, uh, well, well, I don't know, say you were at 1,200 feet, and it kind of looked like she was heading down towards the water, uh-huh. uh, towards the ballad area, and then, poof, it just goes down. But I could see that, at least I thought, I didn't think it was right. Yeah. Okay, now if we send you a short questionnaire, would you have time to fill it out? Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Yeah, Bob, this is Chuck. Yes, How are you doing tonight? Oh, busy, busy. I bet you are. What's new down there? Well, you know, I lost in all the confusion that was here last night. I lost the names and numbers of those uh, hunters that uh, that you had. Okay, coming up. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, what luck you have you had in plotting uh, this thing? Oh, we're coming up, putting the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle together. Uh-huh. We've got, uh, we know we've got two and possibly three different objects, and. Uh, I'm waiting now for some questionnaires to come back for what I need is final time and uh, the direction, the, the flight direction. Right. And uh, I'll get those put together where I think we'll be coming up with as many as three. Uh, 
Does it look like uh, a, a lot of the stuff took place between six and seven? The majority, <clears throat> it took place between uh, six and uh, thirty. Six thirty. Yeah, and then that that impact business down there in uh, Rocky Hill. Is, uh, we're going to really have to dig into FAA for that to get that signed and the uh, different information reported by those airline pilots. Because apparently there weren't too many people on the ground that saw that. Well, I couldn't, we couldn't find, we talked to a few people, but we couldn't find anybody who saw it uh, down there near Sahela. It was just over down there seen by these pilots. Uh, but what makes me, um, I do believe there's a good chance something went down there is that uh, you know, the pilots that did see it go down, at least according to the Fort Lewis, did say it appeared to explode at low-level eleva elevation. Uh -huh. And, of course, then there's a pilot who says it definitely was a crater-type object, you know. Yeah. And I went down, um, uh, when we were flying down there uh, Friday, looking all over, I saw, you know, about three or four flash burns. But... If I was flying in an airplane and I was a, a military pilot, if, uh, if I saw something that, you know, appeared to be a flash burn in a heavily ordered area like that, or appeared to be any kind of a burn, I don't think I would say it was definitely a crater, unless, you know, I could actually tell it was a crater, you know? Yeah. And the flash burns we saw didn't look anything like a crater. You know, they were just had a bunch of wood piled on top to get in, they were just burning away. Yeah. Well, I listened to the, uh description uh, was given by that army helicopter pilot. He didn't seem to think it was a flash burn. Yeah. So I hope uh, as soon as there's damn it, as soon as we get some good weather down there, we're going to go back down for one more look, and I sure hope it comes about pretty soon. Say, you know, I got a call this morning from a Dannyson. Did anyone forward information to you on that? No, not that. Okay, well, he said he called KJR early this morning, and they gave uh, him our number. Uh -huh. And he was calling from Seaport, Washington. And he's in the Navy up there, stationed at the Naval Barracks in Seaport. And he said he saw an object came down and just scared the hell out of him about 6, 20 years, so let's see, 6, 10 this morning. He said it was about 200 feet off of the ground. You couldn't have. Yeah. I thought maybe that you would have got it being that he called in there first. Uh, I'll be doing it. Well, that's not the problem with him, somebody. I'll be doing it. I've been so busy, I haven't been able to get back to him. But uh, I'll tell you, when I was talking to him, his voice was still quivering. He said, boy, that thing just scared the shit out of me. <laughs> oh, I'll be doing it. It certainly came down real low, and it was moving fairly slow. And the, the glow around the object went out, so he could see a little bit of the superstructure. Well, he kind of appeared to be a car. Yeah, he said some kind of a, of a, a rectangular shaped object with louvers on it. With what on it? Louvers. Well, I also got a hold of that doctor. Oh, you did? You want his phone number? Uh, yeah, yeah, as long as you got it, sir. Okay. And uh, he said he'd be happy to talk to you, man. Yeah, I got him. Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering what he meant. We did get a couple of nice comments on tape from him. Good. So, uh, yeah, I wish we individually here had more time to run this thing down. It's just that, you know, with being here and having to get the news on, it just doesn't need too much, uh, you know, afterburner energy. Right, it takes a lot of investigation. Oh, God, it is all day. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, I'll, um, as soon as the weather clears, if we jump on down there, I'll make sure that you wanted the first to know what, what is anything we have to run across. But I, uh... I have a feeling right now that if anything was down there, I have a hunch whoever officially was in charge of looking for it may have gotten there and got, gotten out what they wanted to. Because uh -huh. I do know that that restriction across the area just uh, came and go, came and went uh, awfully seriously. Sure. Well, they could send the ground party and there was no problem. Yeah, well, the only problem with that is, is that they didn't have a pinpointed, not exactly, they had it in with a, a very large square mile area. And it is rugged country up there, and you probably could stumble around for a couple of days without ever running across it, you know. But here, take this into consideration. They can go in there for the 
helicopter. They've got sophisticated uh, cameras now with infrared, and even if the thing had landed and taken off within 24 hours, they could go in and take a picture and still know it was there, or had been there. Well, cool. So, who knows what they're going to do? Yeah. They're not talking as usual. Well, that's interesting. Okay, Bob, we'll check back out with you later on. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay, bye-bye. Yeah, I'm Rob. This is Chuck. Yes, sir. How are you doing tonight? Not so bad. You looking forward to Thanksgiving? Oh, you bet. <laughs> you get tomorrow off? Nope. Oh, you could. Lucky me. Oh, uh, son of a gun. Well, I'm going to but I'm going to get the first Thanksgiving off I've had in four years. <laughs> so I'm kind of excited about that. <laughs> well, I was just getting ready to leave here, and I thought I was going to be buzz. <laughs> that I was on the phone today for a couple of hours to uh, <clears throat> the supervisor of the I worked at the Echo Flight Control Center that night. Uh-huh. There were four tapes, and I also talked to, oh, I forget the guy's capacity, but he works in an area of uh, support to the radar man. Yeah. And I talked to them, and uh, for the first time since this whole thing began, I'm convinced that something did now go down in that general area, did impact, did cause a crater, and some sort of a fire. Uh-huh. And I also talked to the pilot, Rick Morgan, again tonight. Yeah. And, uh, and I think the problem is, is that, number one, everybody is looking in the wrong area. Uh-huh. Uh, I think they blew a thousand dollars worth of helicopter rides for nothing. We were looking uh, in an area just east of Chehalis, but was really, I think, just about northwest, or north or west, or whatever, whatever it is, of the area where we saw this thing. And uh, we were just a little bit too far, what would it have been, too far south. Too far south, yeah. Like 13 miles now. Well, whatever it would be. I haven't really had a chance to sit out with a map yet. Uh, so anyway, we were just uh, a little bit off the track there. And I'll tell you, I don't know how the hell that happened because we got our bearings from McCord that day. We ventured us in and they told us that was the area. And all the other new people and shoppers that day seemed to be searching in the same area. So I just... I wonder if they have some of these extra off in the wrong area on purpose. Uh, I mentioned this to uh, one of the fellows the day after when they just started the search, and they came to a location <coughs> from the McKinnon area south, and I said it sounds very much to me like somebody doing a little bit of uh, job in here. Oh, well, it's just, um, <coughs> You know, there's still just a lot of things that don't gel. Now, maybe somebody made a mistake or whatever. We were in the general area of McKinnis and the Bard area, that type of thing, but I don't think we were, we were, we were, uh, I'm going to have seen it go down. Anyway, one of the interesting sidelights that occurred today was that on the Friday, I have an appointment there with one of the supervisors at the uh, flight control center in Albert, and I'm going to be uh, listening to tape of uh, radio transmissions that night. And, uh, so that may be a section of Well, you've got good connections out there, Well, it took me an hour and a half to two on the phone to get to all the red tape to find out that, uh, you know, how you do it. Yeah. Did you get all this conversation on tape tonight? Uh, no, no, I didn't. Mm-hmm. Um, and then what else? And then I'm going to see if I can work out a deal with um, the commanding officer mm-hmm. the next time they run a training flight. If they can, as a courtesy to the world of media, run us by, see if we can stop that area, see if he can take, take me back to where he saw this thing. Yeah, well, is, is he still insisting that he saw something on the ground? Oh, yeah. And the end of three people who were in his chopper, his co-pilot and navigator and other guy, and they all saw this thing. And I asked him, now he says, now he, now he changed the story a little bit. And uh, we had him, Last time, saying definitely it was a crater. Now he says, well, to all rights, it looked to him like a crater, although it could have been a flash fire. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, what do you mean? He says, well, you know, it's just that height and in the dark. I suppose it's very chance that it could have been that. But he says, that's not what it looked like to me. He says, uh, that night when we were going out there to look for this thing, we saw three flash fires before we saw it made this setting, and they looked different than the crater-like object that we described. Yeah. Well, how about the FAA? Did they say anything about tracking anything going down? 
They said nothing was tracked, no, nothing was tracked on radar. Uh, I will double check that probably when I go out there. But also what was interesting was that uh, two pilots, two uh, private pilots were the ones that had seen this thing go down. Mm. They've seen a large uh, white flashing object or whatever, not flashing, but you know, a large bright object. They see the cars. Well, if it appeared to have stored at low-level elevation or appeared to have impacted with a ground. And it was at this point that they were, you know, talking about the force of the FAA. So the FAA called McCord and asked him to send a chopper out. Well, McCord, uh, I guess, evidently got in touch with Fort Lewis, and that's where uh, Rich Morgan came into play. And uh, so that's how all of that happened. But the chopper, but the first fixed-away civilian pilot, he indicated to the guys at the FAA that he knew a flash fire when he saw one. He said he worked for the Forest Service and that what he saw was definitely not a flash fire. Um, yeah, Earl, I forget his last name, but Earl somebody, I have it in my notes, who was supervising that night. I asked him, you know what he thought about it all. He's been there 20 years. And he says, well, they all started fire from the eyewitness accounts that were flying around that night, that whatever it was, it was not a flash fire. Wow. He did say that they got some ET, I guess ETR or ETI signals that night, and what that is is that's that uh, emergency locator transmitter. Right. Because the plane goes down. Yeah. And at first they had feared that it might have been a plane that went down. Well, of course, uh, no planes that they know of have been uh, reported down. And there were sporadic signals they couldn't really pinpoint or anything. So that was the original purpose for the helicopter. So, um, so anyway, that's where it all stands now. That's very interesting that some didn't make any big view regarding picking up their static gates. Well, he did say he tried to talk with Lewis County. He said, uh, he said that they have a, they do have an off purpose frequency band because they are an emergency uh, action helicopter. In other words, they work out of uh, Fort Lewis on a, uh, you know, if there's a national disaster or somebody's lost or any kind of emergency help is needed, that's uh, the type of flights they fly. Yeah. And he did say that they have a uh, all multi-purpose band that they can call anybody with. And he called the Lewis County Sheriff's Office and tried to uh, get him to send somebody out there, but he did say there was a lot of static and stuff. Uh, on the radio that night. Mm -hmm. Now, what does that to signify? Well, the trucks and uh, UFOs are in the area. They have a tendency to create terrific radio interference uh -huh. in the form of uh, either partial disruption or complete disruption. Uh -huh. And it's, uh, it's easy to notice the research in the form of heavy static. Uh, but, uh, the thing that uh, impressed me was when that uh, first uh, came on the air the next morning and he described this thing on the ground as looking like uh, a big oval, brilliant in the center, and like fire around the edges. And he's seen this thing through a, a cloud layer 2,000 feet up. Uh, yeah, I, um, I think I've seen and I wasn't sure before, but I'm sure now that something probably, uh, something did hit the ground out there. And I, uh, I just, uh, uh, I just wish to God that uh, this thing goes out. We can at least pinpoint where it was, if indeed it did hit. Uh, there's just so much damn country out there, you know. I mean, I wasn't sure whether he'd be able to uh, you know, find it again. He did say that he could factor himself into uh, the general area that he was searching that night, but he didn't know if he'd be able to... Uh, to find it again because it was dark. He couldn't, uh, he couldn't identify the type of terrain he was over, you know, yeah. except that it was hilly. Yeah. So uh, I'm hoping that my next bet is that I'll be able to talk to the commanding officer and let him go with him uh, the next time we have a training flight in the area and then let us uh, just sit on over there during this thing yeah. to uh, take a look for it. Well, I'm very inclined to think that if you do find the spot where it came down, instead of finding a crater, you're just going to find a big uh, impression in the ground, maybe with some burned or scorched areas around it. Oh, that would be something. 
Okay, anyway. Because uh, we get back to the, the uh, some of the evidence that the music goes up with any kind of a, 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 a meteor or a bullet and impact, such as the sonic boom when it's coming in and the seismic activity and so forth. And none of this stuff is going up at all. Uh, you sure that no seismic activity has showed up? No, I checked with the University of Washington. He said absolutely nothing. And that right. area up there is saturated with seismic Well, that's, that's very interesting. That's very interesting. And I asked the man specifically if anything had hit of any size to be a stator which uh, had been described or even slightly to be that crater. If it would register, you say absolutely. The question is, would register. Oh, we got it. And then the bullies come in and the steel is big. They make one hell of a ton of steel. What have you been able to determine? Uh, anything new or anything startling? No, just what I passed on uh, last time we talked. That uh, there's definitely four different options in four different places at four different times now. Bob, do you suppose I could get you to send me a summary of your activity on this trip? Oh, I'm writing up a report right now. You are. Yeah, are we going to include any kind of a map or anything yeah, with it? Yeah, it would be a marked map. Okay. Very definitely. Well, can I get you, uh, when you get done, that to send you a copy of it? Absolutely. And uh, everything that you can uh, have on that stuff, because that would be a great help to me as I continue on with this thing. Will do. Um, do you have any, uh, do you know any people down in the Sahelis area, the McKinney area, around in that area that, uh, if we got this thing decently pinpointed, uh, and perhaps couldn't get in with a chopper to, uh, to help us look down there? No. Okay. Our little, our, uh, posted, the contact is down in Longview. Okay. Okay. I just thought I'd check that out. Uh, so when do you think you'll have your, uh, have your report done on it. Well, I'm trying to have it out by Monday. I see. Is this coming out of the regular uh, newsletter? No, it'll be separate. I see. It's a special report on this particular incident. Uh-huh. Who, uh, who gets copies of this, by the way? Well, I thought I'd mail them out to all the news media. Uh-huh. But I'll uh, get yours out first if you want to. Yeah, I, I would appreciate that. It'll be there. Okay. Where are you working Monday? Uh, when am I working? Eight hours. Oh, I work on the way from 5 until 11. Yeah, and then uh, I usually have three hours during the day that I just usually uh, you know, use up my own time. Uh-huh. So, uh... Well, I know if I can, if I get this thing finished, I'll deliver it in person. Oh, well, that'd be fine. Now, uh, Jerry West, I don't know if you're familiar with Jerry, but he works here in the afternoon. Uh-huh. Uh, Les works here in the morning. And, uh... You know, just pop in and drop it in, that'd be more than fine. Indeed. Okay, Bob, well, we'll talk to you later. Yeah, well, I sure appreciate you letting me know what's going on. You betcha. And uh, have a nice day tomorrow. Yeah, if I get that, uh, get a, when I get to that tape, I'll see if uh, I can tape it uh, with my machine and take it from there. That'd be great. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Oh, I was going to ask you, did you ever complete uh, and get typed out your results of the, the investigation of the 14th? I just finished typing it tonight, and I'm going to get her on the mimeograph tomorrow. Oh, good, good. Uh, I did, uh, I spent all day one day out of the FAA Flight Service Center in Auburn, right? How'd you make out? Well, I finally got through that tape, and they let me listen to the tape that night. Then they also let me run off a copy of it. And uh, I have conditional permission to broadcast. And what I have to do now uh, uh, to get the final permission is they would like to hear what we're going to do with it. I see. And their concern naturally is that we don't uh, make misuse of the tape. Right. In other words, give somebody the impression of something that didn't happen. Right. So I still have yet to type out the rest of the story. And uh, what I'm going to do is just do a recreation of that night and uh, let people know what happened at what time. And it's interesting that the one of the supervisors out there, who was kind of uh, handling me that day, as you say, oh, he just tried to, you know, poo-poo the whole thing, and there was really nothing, and he listened to the tape, and there was nothing on there. The tape is very significant. There were at least, was it, I can't remember, it's, well, I got all the information at home. It's, there were four or five aircraft involved. And here's how it all developed. If you're interested, uh, 
Mm-hmm. Definitely. Okay, here's how it all developed. The first call came in about 7.48. Now, I, well, when I say the first call, I'm saying the first call regarding this McKenna thing. Yes. Earlier in the evening, they had had reports of what had been described evidently by pilots as uh, high, high-altitude high meteor showers, which are evidently a, a fairly common occurrence. Yes. And now, that, now these reports were about 5 o'clock that night. Then at about almost 7.48 on the nose, if I recall correctly from my info, the first report came in from a small private craft identifying himself on the tape as 2-0 X-ray. And he was flying in that area near McKenna, flying uh, in a, what was it, a southerly direction? No. Well, I forget the direction, but he was, you know, approaching the uh, Seattle Flight Service's uh, area that they're responsible for. Yes. And he called in, he says, uh, 2 zero X-ray calling Seattle Flight Center. Something, it looks like something just exploded off my right wing tip. And they asked him uh, if it looked like an aircraft, and he said he couldn't tell. And then United, a United commercial jet, evidently flying up from Portland, the captain calls in and says, this is United Flight, whatever it was, uh, reaffirming that uh, Seattle Flight Center, all three of us saw it. Uh, it looked like it was an explosion either on the ground or I think a low level elevation. And then 2-0 X-ray butts back in and says, well, it was off, it was high in the sky when I saw it. Okay, at this point, Seattle Flight Center thinks that maybe a plane might have gone down. Oh, uh, during this time, they're describing what appear to be fires down below. Yes. Or, no, wait, I, I take that back. I take that back. That's later. Uh, so at this point, the, uh, the uh, FAA is concerned that a plane might be down, and so they ask him about fuselage and, you know, and did it look like a plane or whatever. Then Seattle Flight asks the United pilot if he can look over on his left because he is flying parallel to 2-0 X-ray. 2-0 X-ray saw this on his right wing tip. So he asked the United pilot, who was flying in a parallel direction, only, you know, quite a distance apart, if he, looked, if he could look to his left and see anything on the ground. To which he says, yeah, it looks like uh, three fires down there, one big one and some smaller ones around it. Mm-hmm. Okay, at this point, another, around this point, another private craft comes in uh, and says, hey, I heard you guys talking about this fireball thing that I saw to my east. And then the Seattle flight comes on and says, no, sure, that would be in a different direction from where, from where you're at. And he comes back on very distorted, but you can make him out, and he says, well, I saw a fireball a fireball fall out of the sky. Okay. So then Seattle Flight Center start, starts getting some sporadic ELT transmissions. You know what those are? No. Okay, that's an emergency locator transmitter. And that is uh, FAA. All planes are required by law to carry these things. And upon impact, they go off and give off a signal if they're working right so that rescue craft can find a downed plane. Mm-hmm. So they start getting some sporadic emissions which uh, is a fairly common occurrence, but nevertheless, they never take any chances, you know. Yes. They always got to find, you know, try to determine, try and find out, you know, sometimes a, a pilot will jam something against one, they'll go off and all sorts of stuff. So at this point, with what the pilots saw and the sporadic beeps, they're really kind of thinking a plane might be down here. So then there is another private craft Oh, by the way, and then, then uh, during this time there was another commercial liner, I believe it was uh, uh, you know, a Northwest Orient, who also confirmed uh, the fire on the ground business. Okay. And then they go on by and go about their business. The United pilot is asked to swoop down as low as he can see and tell him what he sees. So at an elevation of 10,000 feet and descending, he gives his description of the fires below. Now, you know, he's still pretty high up in the air, and he then plots his, he gives uh, the Seattle Flight Center his coordinates so that they can plot the area where this thing is. Yes. Okay. So then they're gone. Then another private craft, I believe he's identified as Gross 54, comes onto the scene. He tells them, uh, he tells them they can, he can see the, uh, see the fire and stuff, and they ask him, now they're thinking heavy, it's a plane down this time, they ask him if he would be kind enough to uh, dip down in and see if he can take a look. Okay. He does, and now at this point, the only two people who got fairly close 
to what it was on the ground was this guy in, I, I forget his identification, but he identified himself. Well, I think it was 2-6 Quebec. 2-6 Quebec. And later on, the, the Fort Lewis pilot were, were the only two guys that got in low enough, right? Well, this is what happened. Anyway, the other four planes were up pretty high. But 2-6 Quebec says, yeah, he'll go down and take a look. So I guess he swoops down to about, oh, 4,000 feet or something. And lo and behold, he gives the same, almost to a T, the same description that he gave the, the military pilot. He comes down and says, yeah, uh, he says, whatever it was, whatever it hit, must have gone in vertical. He says, if it was a plane, it went in vertical. Because it looks like there's some sort of a, looks like it cutted out the area. Looks like kerosene or some kind of fuel burning. Uh, he says, uh, what else did he say? He says, um, Oh, this is the point where he says, I've seen a lot of flash fires, and that's no flash fire. So is this the one that had previous experience with the Forest Service? Well, evidently, yeah, this is the guy. Uh, this is the guy that says, I've seen a lot of flash fires, and that's no flash fire. Okay. He says, uh, the, the area is pretty gutted out down there, and uh, I can't remember if he used the word crater or not, but it was, uh, I mean, it was obvious to him at three or 4,000 feet that it was not a flash fire, and that it was, there was some kind of a hole in the ground, or what appeared to be a hole which is the same description that gave, and, and his, the three crewmen who were board chopper talked it over, and that's the conclusion they came to, that it was some sort of a crater. And, and this guy in 2-6 Quebec were the only pilots that night who went down close enough to get, a, to get any kind of a look at it. And their descriptions match up almost to a T. That is good. <clears throat> and the next thing I found out, the reason why nobody found it the next day, including us, that we were looking in the wrong area. Well, should you have been look, looking further north? No, well, we were north northwest of where, according to this United Airlines pilot, he saw this thing. Yes. And uh, the the elevation of the peaks around there does not correspond with the area that we were looking at. Would that put it about 13 miles south of McKenna, the original? Or they should have been I've got the I've got the coordinates at home, and I uh, I can't I think it would, yeah it sounds that sounds about right. I've got the coordinates in pilot talk. Yes. Uh, I don't know physically where that place is. At. I know I've got the coordinates written down in, in pilot lingo. Yeah. But I do know that we were a good four to five statute miles uh, out of that area. Right. We never we never looked. We we should have looked. See, what's opposite of north, northwest? South, southeast? Yeah. Okay, we should have looked more south, southeast. Well, the reason I mentioned that was because when I talked to FAA information officer, he gave me about four different locations that they had. Uh -huh. Well, I'll tell you, as far as I can determine, we were down there the next day in a helicopter, and the only other, there were two other helicopters, the Fort Lewis Sheriff's Office, and I think an, uh, a news uh, AP had a helicopter down there. And we were all looking in the same area, which is not the right place, according to this United pilot who radioed in his location at the time he was directly over this thing. Now, now, granted, he was descending at the time he gave his location over this thing, but they tell me at the FAA that would have put us within a mile of it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, now here, here's an important point, too. I was reading some uh, statements made by some of the astronomers who came out here to investigate this thing, and... They all uh, stated uh, to the man that there is no case on history where a meteor has ever struck the Earth and started a fire. Well, that kind of <laughs> set me back a little bit, you know. I'd never heard of that before. Hmm. So what, if something struck down there, plowed in, why uh, it wasn't a meteor? Well, you know, I would tend to think, I would tend to think that if it weren't for the description of the gave and this guy in 26 Quebec gave, I would, I would tend to, uh, to think it was a flash fire, you know, because I've been thinking about that too, and I have to agree that if, if a meteor probably hit, you know, number one, as you said, it would have registered on the, on the sensors for the seismograph. Oh, yes. Number two, it probably would have caused quite a jolt around there. You know, if there was any kind of a massive object. Well, every person within 
uh, 25 miles, we would have called it. And the, and the only thing, one of the other possibilities is... That's why I was interested in uh, getting a hold of that. Uh, the, and I tried, and I, I didn't have any success. I wanted to find out whether he really believed he was looking at a, at a creator. Oh, or, I told you I talked to him a second time, didn't I? Yes. And he told me again the second time the way they came to the conclusion that it was a crater was that they had passed three slash fires before they got to this one. And to, to him and the three other guys who were aboard, it looked like a crater. Uh-huh. And that's how they came to that conclusion, because it didn't look like the other one. South of the Mossy Rock Sinbar area. Uh-huh. And they had climbed this hill so they could get a good view of the area around and looking for deer. And they got to the top of the hill, and they looked north, and here, he says, it was almost in a straight line uh, between uh, Mossy Rock and Sinbar, and he figured off into the Sinbar area was this huge, glowing, white object hovering above this hill right over the treetops. Uh-huh. And uh, they watched this thing for about seven minutes. Said that uh, it remained stationary for several minutes, and then it started moving upward. And he finally got the binoculars on the thing, and he said it was so big that it took in about three fourths of the binocular view, and it moved off to. Well, he must have a pretty good shot, a pretty good look at it then. Yes, very <laughs> definitely. He said there was a rotating band around the center of the object, and as it moved upward, it changed from white to pink to red, and as it built up speed. Uh, it got up to a, uh, a bright red and then moved off to the southwest. Did he, did he notice any windows or anything? No, just the light effect around it. But it moved out of the Sinbar area. Now, I'm, I'm wondering... You know, how, high did he, how high did he say around the treetops it was? Right at the treetops. Uh-huh. I, uh, I haven't had a chance to get back to him. He was calling from uh, the job. He works for Weyerhaeuser. Uh-huh. And uh, he was calling from the field, apparently, because he and his boss had worked all morning trying to find an organization to, to report this to. Uh-huh. And he finally got through to us, and I'm going to call back uh, this week to his home. He'll be back out of the field, apparently. Uh-huh. He works with uh, research of some kind out in the forest. And uh, I'll go into this a little uh, deeper with him regarding... Uh, the possibility that this thing could have been sitting on the ground in that area. But, uh... Oh, wait. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hold on a second. I, I... The more possibility, possibilities I come up with, you know, if you, if you look at all of the possibilities, you have to include that if there was a crater, there is a possibility, because of the logging and stuff in that area, Somebody may have gotten a hold of some dynamite. Maybe some kids, right? Possible. You know, they could have. They could have just blown a goddamn hole in the ground. You know, out in the woods, just so nobody would get hurt. Just to, just to, you know, blow up some dynamite. And they could have just, uh, you know, thrown about ten sticks in and just a little long fuse and got the hell out and just blew a hell of a hole in the, in the woods out there. But considering the fact that it's super rugged territory, it's not very likely that they that's you're right. That you, you, that, that, you always have to look at that. Yeah. There's and then, of course, there. that particular case there is only part of the picture because uh, we we know there were, were five objects that night, five separate objects at different times and different locations. And this will show up on the map I'm going to send you. And it all started just about a little after 5 p.m. Uh-huh. And these objects, every one of them were traveling with the exception of the one down by Sinbar and Every one of them were traveling in a horizontal trajectory, and this is an extreme rarity for any kind Well, of all right, you have to look at this, too. It could, it could be, possibly, that working in what, uh, what uh, what's his name, uh, 26 Quebec or whatever, what they were over and over could have been a slash fire, a large one, or it could have been a slash fire where they, you know, maybe a, maybe a bulldozer had dug out a big hole to uh, keep it from, uh, you know, spreading around or something, you know. I, I just, um, you know, there, there's just so many possibilities of what it could be. It just is, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's mind-boggling. Oh, sure. And, uh, and it could also be something sitting on the ground. 
Yeah, you know, I tell you, I'm, I'm so, so damn discouraged about this thing because uh, blew a thousand dollars worth of helicopter rides looking in the wrong goddamn area, and I just know that, uh, you know, somebody's probably gotten to this thing long before now. Whatever, you know, whatever it was. Right. And I'm just debating on whether to keep trying to get in there and take a look at you it. see, the big problem on that particular case was the lack of witnesses on the ground to get any kind of a triangulation. And I only know of four. And this is rare, extremely rare for anything uh, that uh, spectacular coming out of the sky, even in a desolate area like that. Hey, Bob, do you know... Uh, I don't know if you catch ever catch the Tomorrow program on uh, NBC. Occasionally. They had an hour one night uh, on UFOs recently, oh, maybe a couple of months ago. Well, that was when the airline pilot was on, or the ex-military pilot. Well, I, I believe, guess he was the airline pilot. I believe it was. Yeah. They also had a producer on from this NBC special that's coming up. Right. Okay, you, you recall him talking about this number, this uh, toll-free number that that uh, they that some government, or, government organization, I believe. That's, uh, no, that's uh, Alan Hynek's organization, Center uh, for UFO Studies. Yeah, in, in other words, uh, there are only a few, you know, agencies in various areas that have this thing. It's not a public uh, number. Yeah, it's just for law enforcement agencies. Yeah, have you ever been able to get your hands on that number? Sure, hang on. And uh, where, do, where is that? What city is that in? That would be, it's in, uh, let's see, it's in Illinois, the state of Illinois, in, um, I think it's Evanston. And what's, and what's the organization? Center for UFO Studies. Center for UFO Studies. Do they uh, depend on you for some of their information? Oh, yes. Any organization they ask to feed to them. Uh, uh, did you happen to talk to them about this incident? One of the uh, investigators called him. And, uh, oh, I see. One of your people. Right. Uh, and had they, had they received any calls from any law enforcement agencies about this thing? Up to that time, they received nothing. And, but after your investigator called, had they gotten anything from anybody? No, no. In other words, nobody, our, nobody not, called and brought this Not thing. to our knowledge. You see, the problem here is that uh, this thing didn't break into the open until the McKenna story came out. Uh -huh. And all of this, all the activity that preceded was just swept under the rug. In fact, I think the whole McKenna story would have been swept under the rug if it had been for KJR. Yeah. That's the sad story of the UFO subject. <laughs> There's another number you might want to uh, chat, and that's the Department of Emergency Services in Olympia. Department Emergency Services. Now, the emergency number there, uh, the reason I'm giving you this is they take the UFO reports, uh -huh. but the emergency number is... And that's where? It's in Olympia. Olympia. And... What, and the, it, what do they have to do with it? Well, they take, uh, they handle the reports through civil defense. Well, you know, I'll tell you, I got one last shot at this thing down at McKenna, and that is, I've talked to Wiggins' CO about the chance of uh, them, on one of their training flights, letting me go along with him in his helicopter and uh, diverting to that area to see if he could find it once again. Uh -huh. And he has, uh, they gave me a conditional okay and that he, he could do that if, like, for example, I was uh, doing a story on their, you know, massed operations down there. He could right. do that, which I said there's no problem. So far, I haven't heard back from him, and I was going to get uh, give him a call here pretty soon, and I haven't had a chance to. But that's about my last shot. There's, you got to get in there with some sort of an aircraft. That's all there is to it. Oh, that's the only way. And uh, I know that the station isn't about to go for any more helicopters. Um, well, if it was midsummer, it'd be a different story. You could get the party together and walk in and kind of scour the area, but not. Boy, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, Bob. You just you could walk in there forever. I mean, it's it really it's so thick in places. I mean, there's a lot of logging roads, but it's so thick that shit, you could be ten feet away from something there and all that huge forest land and not see it. Right. It's, it'd be a waste of time, unless you had it pretty well pinpointed. Yeah. And. Uh, so, uh, so anyway, so that's 
for us. There's one thing I want to find out. If we get a uh, UFO scoop story, how, how do we get a hold of you if you're not working? Yeah, this damn thing, God, uh, I'll tell you, it just, uh, it irks me. I mean, it, it, it irks me that, that somehow, uh, I want to believe that nobody did it on purpose, but somehow we did, we just didn't get the right stuff, you know, the right information to go down there and look for it. It just really irks me. Well, let me put it this way. <clears throat> if something came out of the sky and that thing was tracked by McCord radar... Which they say it wasn't. Yeah. Uh, which, um, uh as possible that it was. Uh -huh. But uh, if it was, and they knew that there was something on the ground, an unknown on the ground, they would have uh, sent the search parties elsewhere. Well, that occurred to me, too, but, but why would they, uh, you know, only divert us by about four or five miles? Why not 10 or 15 to really keep us away from it, you know, or 20 or 30, you know? Well, with that kind of terrain and that kind of weather... <laughs> You were quite a way south of the original position of 13 miles south of McKinnon. Yeah. Well, son of a gun. Well. But like I said, if they could send a helicopter over there with uh, infrared sensing equipment, any area where they thought something came down, and even if it had left, if it had crashed or if it had landed and left, they would have known about it.
blue collar type people like I don't think. Yes. And, well, I know that he was uh, he was working on that, and this thing of the 14th came along, and that really threw us off track because we've been really hitting that pretty hard. But uh, I'll get him on that again and uh, see if we can't get a hold of those negatives and get some results on it. You get around the idea that maybe I could put together, you know, with this uh, the report uh, uh, with the tapes of the, uh, the the tapes I have of the FAA Flight Control Center that night. Yes. I'm kicking around the idea maybe it might not, might not be a bad idea to put a half-hour program together. Use that as the intro and perhaps have you with your findings following that and then maybe we could uh, bring in uh, or perhaps a doctor sent to somebody. That would be interesting. Yeah, I'll have to think about that. But that was really a special night, <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was odd. I, you know, I must admit, and I'm, uh, I, like a lot of other people, are attracted by oddities. And I was, uh, the, most, the thing that I'm most amazed about most amazed about is, is the, that couple from Tacoma, whose name I can't recall now, who called me and, you know, the, the conversation between, uh, I guess it was Bitten, and the Lewis County Sheriff's Office had splashed over, and they had heard, they had heard everything right on, I found out later, except the part about the ground troops moving in. Yeah, uh, that, that was really great. Yeah, and, she was, uh, and she was damn sure that that's what she heard. And, and actually, as I, when I talked later with the Lewis County Sheriff's Office, I found out that that's what the conversation had been. Uh -huh. and, uh, you know, the, the, the thing that is, uh, really put a lot of uh, support under the events of that night, or at least one of the, the major events of that, was the object that passed from the northwest to the southeast. I got several letters from people up on uh, Woodby Island and uh, several from the Navy personnel up there, including the commander of a uh, naval flight, which had just landed. Uh -huh. And they were parked on the runway at the time. And he was looking due north. He gave all the proper coordinates. Uh -huh. And uh, he said when this object came in to view, it moved across the sky from northwest to southeast. And they watched and watched and watched and watched. And he says they watched that thing from four to five minutes. He was timing it with his... Uh, uh -huh. And uh, he says he's never seen anything like it. Well, I'll be damned. And then I got uh, one of our contacts up in Snohomish County and got a chance to talk to a lot of the sheriff's deputies that were looking for the escaped prisoners up right, on Reno yeah. Island at the right. time. Uh -huh. And... Uh, that was another object in itself there. That thing passed from due north to straight south right over Camino Island. Go fast or slow? Very slow. In fact, the one officer who first spotted it in the northern sky, he says at first it was two brilliant orange lights hanging in the sky, and then they expanded and, and merged. And then the thing started to move, and the sparks started flying out the back, and here she came, due south, right over the island, and heading due south towards Seattle. And that's where that uh, copter pilot, McKenna, picked it up, and then that student on uh, Queen Anne Hill. I'll be there. Well, the next step is, I guess, my, see if I can get get a clear day and see if the Air Force will let me go on a helicopter with you. He said he'd like to go out there again, you know, just to see what it was. Oh, that would be great. Get a nice clear day. Wow. Well, well, I'll tell you. Listen, since that happened, have you had any other uh, reports of anything of any kind of nature? No, things have been real quiet around here. Oh. Well... I'll do what I'll do. I'll kick around the idea of put, maybe putting together a half hour program and it take. Would you be interested in that? Sure. Okay, if I... The uh, determining factor is time, if I can get time enough to schedule everything to do it. But I think that might be, uh, I don't know, might, you know, might be kind of fun to do. Well, your listeners, listeners are real interested in that subject anyway. Oh, you betcha. Every time we have something like that, it goes, you know, crazy. 
That thing was, uh, I think now in uh, the call with tonight is odd. Did you did you ever call the, the, the two couple, the couple that uh, I gave you the phone number? Oh, yes. Yeah, the, the ones that were driving down towards Milton. Well, she said they were south of I-5 near Tacoma. Yeah, just entering Milton, right a little community there at Milton. Yeah, did you talk to them? Yes. What did you think? <clears throat> well, I tell you, he said that this uh, object was huge. He said it was traveling under the clouds. And that I asked him, well, what about the size? How would you um, estimate the size? And he says, well, you could take a car key, the round portion of the car key, and hold it up to the sky and just hold it out. He says, that's about the size that thing was in the sky. This is the method used for determining size real quick like. And that would be just about uh, as big as your thumb out there, the end of your thumb. That'd be pretty good. And that is big. And he says it was low under the clouds. And he said it came over the top to the car, almost the top, slightly to the west. And that when it got out in front of them, it just clicked out, just like snapping off the light. What kind of colors did he give you? Blue, blue green, blue white. Huh? So. But unfortunately, the thing wasn't in sight long enough to really get any data out of it. Well, that baffles me. I mean, I just can't see why they wouldn't pick up something like that on radar. No, it's maybe they do, and just tell me they don't. I guess it's always a possibility. But then we get, you know, I got a call from the one guy who said he said he saw it. It was a, it was a shooting star. And another guy who said he saw it looked like a shooting star. Well, in other words, there were more than Probably more than one, one or two people that saw it. Right. In your experience, have you ever, have you ever called anybody and, and on something like that, and had them, had them ever tell you that they tracked anything? No, no. This, uh, there's very strict regulations regarding putting out that kind of information. Not only for the military, but the FAA too. You know, that's something I never did ask anybody. I never did ask them if, if they, if I called there and I asked them about that, if they could tell me that. Something I should probably do. Well, listen, Rob, we're looking forward to receiving your information on that. I'm going to try to have that in the mail tomorrow. Yeah, and uh, I'll let you know, naturally, if I decide to put a half hour thing together on that deal. Great. Okay? Right. Talk to you later. Right, Chad. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Yes, sir. Uh, Bob, got this thing here in the mail. Yes. Uh, the evening of November 14. Uh-huh. Bob, if I am reading the math correctly, there wasn't just one meteor, but one, two, five. Five. Five objects. Let me ask you about that on tape. That's phenomenal. Okay. So to speak. Um, okay, Bob Gribble, uh, phenomenal research. Okay, we have been told by the authorities, the Big A, uh, that, that there was a meteor that, that crashed... First, we were told in Centralia, then they started looking for it in eastern Washington. What do you think happened, and, and uh, how credible is this, and how many objects were there, really? Well, actually, there were five objects involved. Unfortunately, the one which was supposed to have impacted with the Earth around McKenna, Washington, uh, was the one that really dominated the activity that night. And this is the particular story that was picked up by the news media. Uh, we started getting reports at 6, oh, about 6.20 that evening, and... Uh, calls came in all night. Of course, we put together the pieces of this jigsaw puzzle and came up with five different objects instead of the one. And I think the reason that uh, the scientific community was not aware of these others is the fact that they were just completely uh, ignored by the news media or possibly the news media just did not know about them. Okay, now why would, why would the scientific community uh, get so hung up on this? You know, why... Do you think they are, uh, the scientific community is a little too fast to write off a UFO sighting? Well, oh yes, I think that uh, the majority of the people associated with the scientific community will ignore any uh, UFO report when it appears to be a meteor. And of course, they concentrated on that particular case because they wanted to get a hold of that meteor before uh, a time lapse. And uh, <clears throat> I think that they were lacking information, uh, whereas 
on that particular evening, we were just getting reports from all over western Washington and certain sections of eastern Washington, and they did not have this data available to them. Hey, no, no, it's, it's kind of a rare phenomenon if, if in fact, there are these, these five objects, and uh, it's kind of interesting that a lot of them appeared to break up and explode. Is that a normal behavior? Well, we don't know for a fact that they did explode. Uh, according to the witnesses, they did break up. Of course, when uh, we get a description that an object has exploded, we immediately look for this uh, clue. Was there any audible sound? Did they pick up sound waves? And, of course, in none of these cases where they broke up did uh, sound waves uh, occur, nor did the case in eastern Washington where it was supposed to have exploded in a very violent explosion, according to the witness, uh, did they hear any sound waves. So, uh, yes, it is common in the field of u ufology where these objects will break up uh, and uh, not create any sound pattern at all. Have you had any speculation at all what kind of an object would fly along, visible for, uh, well, you know, in the case of most of them, over 100 miles, and, and why would an object do that and then break up? Well, <clears throat> we feel that it could be some kind of a monitoring missile, which is... Uh, attempting to pick up some kind of data in the particular area where the breakup was reported. Or we are dealing with a, an electrical phenomenon of some kind in which the object itself actually does not break up but merely uh, uh, puts off uh, electrical charges which make it appear that it has broke up. Outstanding, Bob. I'm still going to get a hold of you one of these days, and we'll take a half hour public affairs program. That would be great. Okay. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right. Old reports on flying saucers? Absolutely. 20 years old? <laughs> that goes back a long way. Yeah. That's just about the time I got into it. Is that right? Right. When I was in pilot training, there were about uh, oh, 500 of us saw one right across the street. Watched it for about, you sat there about three minutes and watched this. And where was this at? At Lackland Air Force Base. Oh. What did the object look like? Kind of glowed. It was a, a little larger than a one bedroom house. It was sitting right over a one bedroom house on the other side of the street. We were on one side of the street standing reveling. And I heard him say underclass on my gaze, and we looked up, and there was a, well, it looked like it was 20 feet across. Say. Kind of glowed, kind of gave an impression of spinning. This was in broad daylight? No, it was just, you know, like a twilight. The sun hadn't come up yet. It was, you know, a real early rivoli. Oh, I see. And we sat there and watched it about three minutes, and an upper classman started walking across the street toward it, and it took off. Any sound? No. I, it, there may have been, an, like, an impression of sound, but I'm not sure any physical sound. Uh -huh. You know, there was maybe, like, an impression of a high-pitched whine but I'm not sure there actually was any sound. I see. It was out of sight over the horizon in half a second or a second. This, uh, about 20 years ago. Yeah, 1954. 54. Yeah, it was a class of 54J pilot training. Now, would this be in the summer or what? Probably just before Christmas, probably about this time of the year. Uh-huh. I don't know if it'd be worth getting in touch with other people to corroborate that or not, but... Well, it was class of 54J, and anybody in that flight, several flights there could have verified it. Okay, what was the name of that air base again? Lackland Air Force Lackland. Base in Texas. It was pre-flight training for pilots. I see. I see. That was at the time, I think, somebody reported that. I never got an official word on it, but I think at the time that was reported to the Air Force, and we were told that was to, we were told unofficially that was to be confidential. Uh huh. And all of us were very careful. They were checking us on security all the time. We were all very careful not to tell anybody. Yes, I can understand uh, that. Well, wow, 54 was a real big year in this country on that UFO reports. Is that right? Oh yes, it was terrific. Yeah. Oh man, we saw that plane. I mean, it was like 30 feet away. Oh jeez. You know. No heat or anything. No, no, no heat, no heat. But it wasn't like a mirage or an illusion, you know. This thing was just glowing all over, like a big light? It, it was kind of glowing. No, it wasn't glowing like a light. It was glowing more like uh, fluorescent paint. I see. Or, or something under a black light or something like that. Did it have any discernible shape? Yeah, it was like two saucers. Rim you know. to rim? Huh? 
two saucers rim to rim. It was kind of like two Frisbees rim to rim, <laughs> uh -huh. as a matter of fact. Rounded at the edges. No, but it kind of it kind of went up, and then something happened. Like, I can't remember too clearly, but there was kind of an impression that near the edge were like a row of portholes, but it was like spinning, so they came off as a line. I of. see. Well, that sounds very common. Does it? Yes. Oh, okay. And I don't remember the colors, but it was kind of colored. It was like grayed down purple and green and yellow or something. And the end, one of the party started walking towards it, and the thing yeah, one of the upperclassmen in uh, charge of us started to walk over. Got about half across the street, and it took off. You figure it was only about 30 feet away? Yeah, it was just a little like two-lane road, and we were like on one edge of the road, and there was a house all 10 feet from the edge of the road, and it was directly over the house, like 20 feet over the house. Uh huh. I mean, it was kind of scary. I, I was like, a lot of us felt like we were expected to be obliterated or something. Yes. You know. Well, we sure appreciate your calling and tell us about this. Okay. I just want, I didn't know if you'd be interested in something that old. But I... Oh, yes. We're interested in anything, especially a close approach like that. It's, yeah. Uh... yeah, I thought it was a fairly rare thing to see it that close and for, you know, three full minutes. Right. right. Uh... Well, we thank you very much. Okay. Please keep our number handy. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Uh, two months ago? Yeah, well, I said it was late October. Okay. I'd like to hear about it. Well, I, I, was, I was about 3 o'clock in the morning, and I was asleep, and I heard this whistling noise. Um, can you imagine a jet in a full dive? Yes. Well, that's what it sounds like. And I woke me up out of a sound sleep, and I went... I didn't turn the light on because I could pick my way through the house in the dark while I was with my eyes with blindfolded, so I didn't bother me to turn the light, keep the lights up. I looked out the bedroom window and I saw this shape. Well, it couldn't have been more than 60 feet off the ground because it was bending over the top of one of the pine trees during the street. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, it was making this, this whistling noise, like I said. And it was, just, it was hovering there. And that in itself was impossible. And so I went to the front door to get a better look at it. And I went to the front door, and I opened the front door, and I looked at it, and it was about 30, there for about 35, 40 seconds. And then it just dwindled, it just took off. No no, 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 no sonic boom, nothing, it just went. And, uh, like, well, Remember the old picture, the old, the picture of the old loose roof when they had a, a, a cannon being fired? Yes. And the projectile going out of the cannon? Yes. And that's what it looked like. Uh -huh. The only thing I can think of is it would be similar to it. And it made, and as I said, it made absolutely no no spoofing noise and no side boom or anything. There's no displacement of air when it, it just went. But as soon as I stepped off the porch and stepped out in full view, it just and that's when it took off. Yes. I mean, as long as I stood on the porch undercover, and uh, I guess well, if there was an intelligence in there, if it, it didn't see me until I moved, and then when I moved, it, 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 then when, as soon as I came out in the full the plain view, it took off. So I can only assume that uh, uh, whoever was in it didn't, didn't want to be seen. Uh, because it's that hour of the morning, he's going to be up. And uh, uh, let me see him. Uh, but it looked, it looked like two plates inverted over one another. There's no lights at all I can see. Now, you say about 80 feet in diameter? About 80 feet across, right. Across, okay, and a dome underneath. Underneath. Do you, do you have any idea of the size in relation to the total diameter of that dome? Oh, the dome would be about... It was in the center of... I'd say about 30, 40 feet across, about half to half half the width uh -huh. of the main body of the UFO. Okay, was that dome transparent? I like I said, it was completely blacked out. I couldn't tell oh, it I was see. transparent. Enough. Okay. Well, I have no idea. Well, but it made it, the reason it made it, and I'm surprised, I'm surprised my wife didn't hear it. I had to wake her up and tell her about it. Did you hear that with me? She didn't know. I didn't hear a thing. But so that's what woke me up first, which was the whistling noise, like a plane in the dive. 
Yeah. Uh, the first thing I thought was, hey, if somebody's in trouble, they're going to crash, you know? And that's why I jumped and looked out the window. There was this, this thing. Approximately how long would you say that you had the thing under observation? Well, from the window for about 15 seconds, and then after I got to the front door for about 35 to 40 seconds. And all of a minute, all together, then? Well, it was a minute all together, but as soon as I stepped out off the porch to get a better look at it, uh-huh. and I stepped out into plain view, it was gone. It's not as quickly as I can stop. I think it just went. I can't say it. I don't, I don't, I won't say it. I can't really, really explain it to you, but... Well, with this, uh, did this thing just move away, or did it just go off like snapping off a light? No, it moved away. It moved away, okay. It moved away like it got smaller. Yeah. It just reduced itself down to nothing then. In a matter of speaking, yes, because it gave the impression of being, of, of gaining distance. Yes, uh-huh, okay. Now, about how far away would that be, that object be from, uh, say, your window? Oh, just across the street. Not more than 50 feet away. The tree that it was bending the top of was was about uh, oh, about 50 feet from the front door. Uh-huh. Now, how about uh, do you have any pets? Yes. Did dogs. you notice that they were disturbed at all? No, they were sound asleep. They were asleep. Oh. And this thing was definitely just dark color. Uh, I. There, there was no color to it at all, I could see, because, uh, like I said, it was 3 o'clock in the morning. It was dark out, and uh, when there, was no, there were no lights, there was no, there was no coloration to it at all. It, it was just a map. Mm-hmm. I could see black against bl- the sky, which was not what had clouds in it, and it was uh, sort of a grayish color. So that's why I could make out the shape of it. And it was hovering over a group of trees? Oh, no, it was over one tree, one particularly. Tree. And as a matter of fact, it was so close to that tree, it was bending the top of the tree over. Okay, let me ask you this. What kind of tree was that? So, that was, uh, you know, fir tree. A regular fir tree, okay. That, that question might sound a little strange, but uh, we had picked up a pattern where these objects are seen ho- hovering over individual very large individual trees. Well, this is a pretty big tree. Uh-huh. But it was, I mean, it was so close to the ground. I could actually see the tree bending and the weight of whatever this thing was resting upon it. Well, then you feel there was a contact between the two. Oh, yes, there was uh-huh. definitely a contact between okay. the tree and the, and the, and the, uh, art, the, uh, art of the craft. Yeah. Okay. Then during daylight, did you take a look at that tree by any chance? Oh, I couldn't get up to the top. That's it. I mean, there was nothing showing from the ground. No, nothing at all showing from the ground. Right. Mm-hmm. And no sound from this thing. Other than the the initial whistling noise right. that broke woke me up in the first place. Right. Okay. Uh, and this happened about October. About the 29th, 28th of October. Okay. And in Seattle. No, I live, I live in Grenada. Oh, okay. It's so, uh, it's that county, isn't it? Right. Okay, is there anything you can add to that? No other witnesses? No, I was the only one that saw it. As far as I know, nobody else mentioned it. But like I said, you know, they, you mentioned that you come back to somebody else and they look to, uh, you know, the eyebrows go up about half an inch. Yes. So yeah. you... I, I'm not surprised that if anybody else thought that they wouldn't mention it. Uh-huh. Well, we sure appreciate your calling, and uh, if I need additional information, can I call back? Well, yes, I, you can, but don't call in the afternoon or evening, because I won't be home. Okay. Anything else? No, that's about it. Okay, goodbye. Thank you very much for calling. Sure. Bye-bye.